Thanks so much. I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of the projects that we have. Um, a little bit of my background is I, I was also a zookeeper at, at Omaha Zoo for 13 years. Um, so I, I worked in several different areas. So I worked in the, the jungle building, small mammals, a little bit of horticulture, um, but I actually spent like my the last eight years um, working in the molecular genetics lab. So I, I put this picture here because I always kind of had like a love for science. When I was real young, I used to spend my allowance money on like Save the Elephant Fund, and um, I used to breed guppies uh, to try to get the biggest, prettiest ones for the science fair. So. Um, and then I, I was, while I was a zookeeper, I was really um, excited about working with kids. So I did a, a, an internship with the Jane Goodall Institute, their Roots and Shoots program, which I really enjoyed. And um, my kids were always getting me um, to do these like outreach projects at their school. We had the, the folks from Sand Cub come once, and um, my daughter told the principal that we're gonna we're gonna save all the the penguins from the oil spill. So <laughs> we had a we had like an all school um, fundraiser. And while I worked at the in the genetics lab in Omaha, I had a chance to work with students really from all over the world on projects from Philippine crocodiles. Uh, we worked on the giraffe project. Um, and our, one of the main focuses was Madagascar. So we would have students come from really all over the world um, that would collect samples in the wild and then um, bring them to, to Omaha Zoo. And we, we helped the students um, run their samples in the molecular genetics lab and then write scientific papers. So um, during that time, I was able to um, travel to Madagascar, and that's where I kind of got hooked. So um, just to give you a little bit of background on that, Madagascar is the world's fourth largest island. Um, it's called a biodiversity hotspot, uh, and that's because of the plants and animals that are found on the island are not found anywhere else on, on Earth. About 80% of all the plants and animals are endemic or found only on the island. So when we really think about that, um, we'll, we'll be like a little bit interactive here. So um, who can tell us what the big map is? <laughs> OK, the United States. I'll help you out on that one. And how many states are in the United States? 50. OK, so think about the 50 states. Uh, Madagascar is about the size of the state of Texas and maybe as long as California. And just to give you an idea about the species diversity um, there, in the United States, in all 50 states, we have about 80 different kinds or different species of frogs. And Madagascar has more than 800. Uh, and that's frogs alone. So um, just to let you know about all the biodiversity on the island. There are also more, well, we, we know that there's actually going to be a few more than 106 different species of lemurs, um, which are prosimians or, or pre-monkeys. And right now, according to the IUCN Red Data List, more than 91% of all lemurs are threatened with extinction. So Mad that's why also Madagascar is a hotspot. The biodiversity that does exist on the island is disappearing at such an alarming rate. And uh, they just, at the IPS meeting in, in Vietnam, uh, we just went ahead and did the next top 25 most endangered primates. Um, and of those top 25, uh, five are, are from Madagascar. So five are lemurs. So um, part of the reason for the, the high levels of uh, extinction or threatening of extinction is that Madagascar is a very poor country. Um, there are about 22 million people that live on the island and they make less than a dollar a day. Right now the average income is about 56 cents a day. Um, over 95 percent of all the people that live on the island are subsistence farmers that practice slash and burn agriculture where they burn down like a section of the forest in order to plant mainly rice crops because culturally um, in Madagascar they eat rice three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner is rice. Um, because of this forest dependence, people um, are really dependent on, upon the forest to meet all their basic needs, clean water, food, shelter, everything um, in their daily life comes from the forest. So if we really think about it, um, 
it's happened really, really fast. Uh, in the past 35 to 40 years, more than 80% of all of that biodiversity has been lost. So if we really think about, um, think about this, Madagascar was one of the last places on Earth that humans inhabited. About 2,000 years ago, humans came to the island of Madagascar, so they had 100% forest cover and today there's less than 10% left. So imagine those 106 species of lemurs, um, chameleons, uh, most of the world's diversity of chameleons um, and geckos is found in Madagascar, those 800 species of frogs. So all of that um, along with those 22 <coughs> excuse me, million people is restricted to this less than 10% of the forest that remains. So um, in 2010, um, I really wanted to do something more. So I wanted to combine my love for animals, uh, the working with the children, and my science background um, together because I really felt that if we wanted to save endangered species, um, it's all about community-based education. So that's when we launched um, Conservation Fusion. We're an international um, nonprofit organization and we have offices in, in Omaha, Nebraska and also in, in Madagascar. So when we think about this, um, we have to remember as humans are, are definitely an integral part of the, the problem, um, they must also be really a, a key, key, key players in the solutions. And so a lot of our projects and programs um, involve a lot of time like spending talking to local communities and finding out what things motivate them and what kind of tangible um, sustainable alternatives we can offer them that can help conservation and also education is really a key component with two-thirds of Madagascar's population under the age of 20 um, it really gives us a an, an opportunity to educate and influence these future leaders of Madagascar and if we really think about think about what's happening in Madagascar it really is so far away from from where we are right here in, in Des Moines it's like right on the other side of the world almost coming back around the other side of the globe so why should we even care what's happening in Madagascar um, because what happens there um, actually is felt here and uh, the, these areas of bi high biodiversity that make up just one percent of the earth's surface um, provide us with clean air water um, more than 80% of all medicines that we know about today come from these areas of high biodiversity. Um, the pink flower is the rosy periwinkle that's found in um, Madagascar that's used in a drug for childhood leukemia. So um, if we think about that, we really are all connected and we all share one world. So we each play like a, a little piece um, in the conservation puzzle. So together with zoos like Blank Park, we are making a difference. And I want to share with you some exciting stories. This is from the ZAC conference last year. And some, some local children created a, a post, some posters about Madagascar. And it is kind of hard to see because the, the, it's really small. But um, together with zoos, we also partner with the, the research team at, at Omaha that has um, sites in Madagascar. And they're actually. He, the, the guy with the blue gloves is holding the northern sportive lemur. Um, they've just mobilized the lemur and they, they're, they've uh, put a radio collar so that the local people can track the lemur. Um, and it's the world's most endangered primate. It's on the top of the top 25 most endangered list. So um, we do partner with the Madagascar Biodiversity Partnership, which is a, a research and community-based NGO. Um, and we work at four permanent sites throughout the island. So um, they all represent uh, critically endangered lemurs and or um, tortoises throughout the island. So I think um, I'm going to talk more explicitly about, about two of the sites. One is Kinjavatu, Madagascar, which is in the sort of the middle of the island. And we started to work there um, because of this cute lemur, the greater bamboo lemur, prolemur simus, which um, was formerly on that top 25 most endangered list and has 
Since the, the project has been working in this uh, Kinjavatu classified forest, the, this lemur's been taken off the list. It's been removed. They thought that it was actually extinct, and it was rediscovered by Dr. Patricia Wright in Ranamafan National Park in the early 70s. And today, um, the largest population of the greater bamboo lemurs exists in Kinjavatu. Um, it's not a protected site, um, as a lot of parks in Madagascar are just protected uh, like paper parks. Um, this area is protected by the local people um, because of some of these education and community-based programs that we're working on. Um, this is another lemur that exists in the Kinjavatu forest. It's the black and white rough lemur. Um, its diet is, is highly frugivorous. It eats the um, mainly fruits. Um, and the difference about this lemur versus some of the other sapacas and things is that um, they, they eat their fruits uh, when they eat the fruits, they eat them kind of almost whole. So when the seeds pass through the digestive system, um, the, the, the seeds are still whole. So we worked together with Malagasy graduate students and um, they found that there were over a hundred different kinds of uh, seeds that they, they found in the lemur's poop. So they have radio collars on the black and white rough lemurs. Um, they go out into the forest and they collect the poop samples. And then they have all these satellite nurseries in the local villages. And um, the local people are learning the techniques on growing these, um, these different species of trees that come from the Varicia. And the germination rates, uh, there was, they just came out with a paper that was published about this project. And the germination rates um, are about 70 to 75 percent higher when the the seeds pass through the lemur's body so um, they're really important seed dispersers in the forest so those are the kinds of things that we at conservation fusion talk to the local people about so um, since 2010 over 235,000 trees have been planted um, in a in a corridor between uh, the mountain of Vatavavi and Kinjavatu. So if you look at this hill, um, you can kind of see that each one of those little brown things has a, like a little bamboo stake and there's a tree planted in each one of those little areas. Um, a really interesting and, and wonderful thing is that um, a lot of the trees are planted by the children in, in Madagascar, which is really important um, because when they are planting these trees, we're, we, we take GPS coordinates of all the trees and we're hoping that um, by by planting these trees and watching them grow, um, that they're not going to want to burn down the, the forest that, that they've planted. It's really about ownership. Um, we also work together with um, lots of uh, women's organizations. Uh, we have a single moms club, and um, thanks to a grant that we got last year from, from the Disney Worldwide Conservation Fund, we were able to hire uh, women's groups at each one of the different uh, satellite nurseries, which really helped to up the production of the, the um, planting of the seedlings. Um, this is a, a recent picture. Okay, so I was just in Madagascar this summer, and this little girl, her name's Vula Narina, and she planted this bupaka tree, which is um, one of the species that comes from the, the lemur poop. And we planted with the school kids in 2011, and I saw her like just on the side of the road night, and I asked her, like, hey, do you wanna come to the nursery with me? Um, let's go check out your tree. And so this was her tree in July 2014. So you can see how, how the trees are really growing. And I might mention really quickly that um, the, the reforestation project is actually headed up by the MVP. And um, they, have, they, they sign contracts with the local people so that everything belongs back to the people. Um, so the contracts are signed so that the land is forever theirs and the trees are forever theirs. And the top 50% is all uh, native tree species that come from the lemur poop. So they, they get the seeds for the black and white rough and also the, the ewe lemurs um, are great seed dispersers. And then there's a band of 35%, which is all cash crops that they can selectively log and um, which will provide a sustainable future for them. And that last 15% of the trees on the hills um, is all fruiting trees so that um, people can either eat the, the, the food that's produced or we help them to try to um, start small entrepreneurial businesses like these little economic engines that can, can provide for them for the future. So um, we just did some, some surveys and we found that more than 60% of all um, students that we polled at, at nine different schools in the Kinjavatu area had a really great knowledge of the, the lemur cycle. 
Um, we work together with um, like the, the researchers, of course, and also local leaders. This is the, the chef's app. He's the superintendent of, of education. Um, this is Dr. Ed Lewis. Um, he's, he heads up the, the Madagascar um, Biodiversity Project, and they, they've darted a, a, this is a juvenile II. Um, it's one of the first ever that's being uh, studied in the wild. Um, in its natural environment ever. So it's really great because it's a chance for local people to see these animals up close. And then um, we try to integrate some of the, the research that's going on into our education program. So one of the first things that we did was um, we created these school mascots for each of the schools to really um, generate pride. When we first started working in in the area, all, almost all the kids raise their hand that they eat the lemurs, and and now um, there's almost no kids that raise their hand. So um, we can see that over a short period of time, um, because we keep coming back and um, doing repeat lessons, that that we have seen um, increases in the lemur populations. This is this is the II. We do like games with the kids um, to talk about the II. Um, Many people in Madagascar uh, used to kill the I.I. just because it was like a bad omen. And now these, these kids in this whole community has really embraced the, the fact that it's something that can bring them a tangible benefit because there's been a really spike in tourism um, in the area because it's one of the only places in Madagascar where you can see all these different species of lemurs up close because they uh, are habituated because of the monitoring that's going on. So we try to carry that over into our, our education lessons. Um, also, we found that 82% of all the students polled um, could um, really recognize all nine species of lemurs that are found in the local forest. And we always follow up our, our themed education programs with a, like a, a festival. We call it an Orama. So we've, we've targeted um, water, trees, lemurs, the future, and, and this year um, we're going to have, the theme's going to be Fiha Vanana, which is um, like a belief that, that ancestors and young people and everyone can come together to do something good. So um, that's going to be the theme this year. So there's a big parade and then each school makes a presentation and they, they write original songs and do skits and it's a great way to evaluate. Um, if they've really learned the lessons that we've been teaching them, it's a way for the for the children to be really kind of become the heroes. And these are just like some of the the signs and things that they've made for some of the projects. Um, we also take the the kids out with the local lemur guides into the forest, which many of them never have been before. Um, so it's a chance for them to see these lemurs um, kind of up close and personal. And it's also a chance for those local lemur guides to. Um, shine as conservation leaders, um, experts, and also um, these are people that they see uh, that, are, that are gaining an income um, as a result of protecting these um, lemurs in the forest. Um, and we also have a, it's a, a really great opportunity um, because we're working with the, the local researchers. They, they follow the I.I. female. Um, they know where her nest is and because they follow her in the night. So a lot of times when we do conservation camp, we get the kids out into the forest under the nest before it gets dark. And then right when it gets dark, we can, we can see the mom come out. And she's actually had three babies um, so far. So it's a really really cool program and it's a great um, opportunity for for these kids to see the II and they often tell their friends. So on, another thing um, about the classrooms in Madagascar is, is this is what it looks like a lot of times. It's really dark in there. Um, we know from some of our surveys with the teachers that a lot of kids abandon school um, during certain seasons of the year because they, they can't grow enough crops and it's too far for them to walk. So um, we've done projects like partner with the local university during Global Youth Service Day and we had kids package up seeds and then we started school gardens and lunch programs at all of the schools at, in, in Madagascar, the, the eight schools, and taught simple um, techniques like the, the row method because they really had never really thought about that. So some just simple, efficient ways that um, they could um, improve the crop and have some food for the kids. Um, and then we always try to make it be um, part where the, the local people give something back. So all the kids brought their own compost from their homes. Um, the, the children are the ones that, that water the garden. And I'll tell you, it, it's not always a success. It, it took many, 
it took several years before the gardens really got going because they would always say like, well, it was doing really great, but uh, we went on break and when we came back, it was everything was dead. <laughs> <laughs> so, or they would say like, well, we, we need bigger gardens, but they didn't really take care of the ones they had. So it really is a process, and I think a lot of field programs um, have success when, when you continually go back and reinforce everything. But um, we have had a lot of um, successful school lunch programs, and we, just this summer we did a, a new um, school garden. We got a, a small grant for the kids. and. Um, some of the schools are actually like selling the vegetables. They also do a school lunch program and with the money that they, they're generating, they're expanding their gardens. They sometimes have buy rice on Wednesdays. Um, we did a, another project with the local university where they painted um, t-shirts with local biodiversity and we had a, a game where the, the kids in Madagascar could learn about um, what the, what the scientists were doing with the samples that they were taking from the, the lemurs and other animals in their backyard. So this is a, like a fake electropharogram. And then we, we, on the fronts of the shirts were the four nucleotide bases. So we did like human DNA chains and made candy uh, DNA, just really something. These kids are kind of like sponges because they don't have any books. Most of the kids really don't even have shoes. Um, so anything that, that we um, are able to present to them, um, they really kind of soak it up. And we, that, that's another thing that um, we're really careful about the messages that we, we try to send. And then we try to publish our, our findings so that we can share what we've uh, done with others. Um, we've, we've done games with kids in the United States um, and then play the games with the kids in Madagascar. This was a giant Candyland game, so if you got to the top and uh, in the Tabi area, if you landed on that square, you have to go back to plant a tree. And um, this one was also about hand washing and um, medicines. Uh, we, we got together with Stephen Nash, who's a, a wonderful wildlife illustrator, and he helped us um, to uh, he, he allowed us to use some of his drawings and we had questions on the back about um, water and these kids did a game. This summer we did uh, an interactive community mapping of the for reforestation corridor so we really um, expanded our programs to be um, working with some of the adults in the community where they they made this giant map to put uh, the different uh, patches there. There was like the permanent trees, uh, cash crops, fruiting trees, and then little um, rice patties. So um, it was really interesting and a wonderful way for us to kind of learn about the perspectives of the local people because um, they, they certainly put a lot more houses than they put trees. Um, so obviously like that might have been something that maybe is a little bit more important to them. Um, they had a lot of fruiting trees on there and very few permanent trees and um, they spent the most time and had the most arguments about um, where the water ways were, were to go. So um, it was a great way for us to also learn about um, how important the water sources are to them. And then we can integrate that into our, our education programs by letting them know by planting the trees we're actually going to gather more rain and keep those water sources going. So um, it's a great um, success for, for us and for um, the local people, a way for us to kind of learn from them. Um, we like to use like um, photos that uh, we take of the kids in some of the, the materials that we use because 100% of, of the, the people said if they're featured in one of our posters or coloring books or something, um, they'll definitely share the message with their friends and family. So it's a great way to kind of um, really help spread the message. We often have movie nights um, at the end of our, our education programs. Um, where we can show uh, the pictures of all the conservation activities that we've done um, so that the whole community can kind of see what kind of things we've been doing with the children. Um, we did a, uh, these, these kids came over from the UK and we did a, a BBC um, series uh, about saving Madagascar um, with these uh, middle school kids from the UK. It was really great. Um, we do community art projects. 
Uh, we take the kids on an annual field trip to a nearby national park, Ranama Fawn. Um, so two kids from, from each of the schools and all the school directors went. And many of them had never really been outside their village, so it was really a great experience. And one of the, the really neat things about it was that um, we got to see the greater bamboo lemur. Um, one of the real reasons for deforestation right in the Kinjivatu area is for gold mining. And when we were able to travel to Ranama Fawn National Park, the kids and the teachers got to see like all the ecotourism, all the local crafts being sold, and they also learned that there are only two remaining greater bamboo lemurs in Ranamafan National Park. Um, one is a really old male who's the father of the female that's left in the park, so um, there will not be any more generations. And nobody really knows exactly why the populations have kind of died out there, but um, in, in Kinjivatu, where these kids live, they see these lemurs like hopping around their backyard all over the place, and we know that there are um, at least 150 individuals. Okay, I'm going to speed up a little bit because I really want to share with you um, some things from our other project site. So we often follow up with, um, with art as evaluations. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about another of the sites, which is Lava Vulu. Um, it's in the, the south of the island, um, right on the, the west side. And um, it's, a, it's a whole other ecosystem. It takes three days just to get there. Um, it takes three days. It's really beautiful. There are all these um, wonderful rock formations in the shallow national park. And when you finally get to Lava Bula, it's very hot and very dry. It's a dry, spiny forest. So even though you might think about Madagascar as like a rainforest, it really has all these really crazy like biological niches. So um, it really is, I always say it's like kind of like Dr. Seuss land. Um, this, this area is also home to the critically endangered radiated tortoise. And it's critically endangered because um, it's being harvested like crazy for poaching, um, a lot of times by local people around the Christmas and Easter holidays, and also for the illegal pet trade. There are confiscations all the time coming out of Madagascar because uh, remember that the Malagasy people make less than a dollar a day, and one of these radiated tortoises can be sold on the black market for $10,000. So um, I'm sure the local people don't get that kind of money in their hands, but I'm sure they get paid like a, a, a pretty great price, so um, more than that $1 a day. So um, it's, really, it's really tough. Um, so what we've done is together with um, our partners at the MVP is we try to put uh, conservation in the hands of the local people and have them benefit from it. This is Monstueta. He's been working for the project for five years as a tortoise guide. He's never ever touched a tortoise because it's fadi or taboo for these this local village of Lava Vulu to even touch the tortoises. Um, the project was started by Ed Lewis. And they have tons of Malagasy students. They have over 40 Malagasy graduate students that work on the project at all four sites. Um, so they do uh, habitat. Uh, they're looking at habitat. Rons is a botany student. And this is Un Uni. And she's studying the, um, the lemurs. So we always try to involve the local people because, again, it's about having those local people take ownership in their future. Um, the the Ring-tailed lemur, I almost forgot the name of that crazy one, most famous. <laughs> the ring-tailed lemur is also found in Madagascar um, in the dry spiny forest near Lava Vulu. So if you look closely, this is one of the photos that we took. Um, you, can you see the ring-tailed lemurs sunning themselves there? This is a giant, like, crazy cave where these ring-tailed lemurs live um, with these pools of water underground and with those uh, albino fish in it. And so this is where they um, are, are following the lemurs. They have, uh, I think, four groups that they're following right now. Um, this is one of the, the ring-tailed lemurs. And this is a, one of the birds, a blue kua. So it's a really different, totally different ecosystem. And um, by partnering with, with great zoos like Blank, Blank Park Zoo, it gives like these local kids an opportunity to really get up close to these um, lemurs that they might not normally see. So this is Rashar, and he's one of the um, Head darters. He's been working with the program for like 15 years, and um, they they've darted this uh, ringtail lemur, and they're putting the radio collar on it. So these these kids um, really want to put the masks on and really watch him um, draw the blood and take the sample. So it's a really neat opportunity um, for these local kids to see the biodiversity right in their own backyard. So of course, uh, education is a, a really key component. 
We do teacher workshops with the local people. Um, this is the chef Zap from Kinjavatu. We brought him and some of the teachers with us. And we have done tortoise festivals with the kids, um, art projects about the tortoises. Um, this is at a, a nearby school in Itampulu. So the kids in Lava Lulu do not have a school. It, it's about 20 kilometers for them to walk to school and it's very, very hot there and they don't have shoes. Um, so a lot of them, did not attend school. And this is another project we did with, with kids in Omaha during a service project and they helped us create these tortoise tambourines. And in 2011 we did the first oops, um, tortoise festival and since there is no um, giraffes, zebras, hippos, or lions in Madagascar, we had to change these little hats from giraffes um, to tortoises so we had some school kids help us with that. So. Um, this is the, the, our first tortoise festival that we did in 2011. Um, the local kids wrote poems about protecting the, the tortoises, um, talked about the importance of the tortoises and the importance of uh, you know, alerting someone if they see poachers in the area. And we also worked with the, the local people in Lava Vulu. Um, they, they, we did these 3D tortoises with summer school kids in Omaha and the, all the community members, even the grown-ups, were like so excited to get these small tokens. Um, we took the kids out into the forest and did transects of the radiated tortoises. These are some of the Malagasy graduate students. This is Salavu. He's teaching them how to tell how old the tortoise is by counting the scoots on its back. And um, this is in 2012. They actually, this was a, a comp, not a confiscation, but these were poachers that come from, from the water in a boat. And so what they do is they turn all the tortoises upside down so they can't get away. And luckily, um, there was a couple kids that were in our program and we said like, if you see the tortoises, um, if you see poachers, tell your teachers, tell your parents, tell the local police. And so um, there were three kids that were in our, our education program and they, they saw the tortoises, and luckily because the, the poachers had a hole in their boat, they were able to like save all those, about 300 tortoises, and they had this big meeting with the villagers and put them all back. So it, it really is like a great story of success. So because they, they really believed that education was important, they wanted to build a school. So the, the um, we had um, meetings with the village elders about um, building a school in Lava Lulu, and they really wanted to call it the Dream School because all of the village elders and the the older people in the village said, like, we, we really thought that we should be like the president of Madagascar or some kind of important government officials um, because we're really smart, but we didn't know how to read and write because we never had a chance to go to school. So it really is our dream that our children and grandchildren would have that opportunity. So we really started working on that. Um, we did some more service projects. We, we had kids during um, Global Youth Service Day make these tortoise um, uniforms for the school. And then um, after the ZAC conference here in, in, uh, in Des Moines is when we really were like, we, we were gonna do it. Like, we're just gonna build the school. This is the um, Nahuda, or the village elder. He's like the chief of the village. And so we're talking about the school and we're selling him like, we don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to do it. So um, we did it. We teamed up with a couple of other zoos, um, including Blank Park Zoo. We, we also did um, more education programs. We worked with the local community. They have a community garden. Um, we taught them how to make fuel efficient stoves. Um, this year, this summer, these are some of the projects that we did with the support of the Blank Park Zoo. We did um, painting projects with the kids in Lava Lulu. Um, we were able to get some, some educational tools, some puppets and things. Um, we had, uh, this is Marin. She was uh, also a, a volunteer from the university, like an intern, and she came to the ZAC conference with me here in, in, in Des Moines, and she was like so inspired by it. Um, she really saved up her money. She came to Madagascar with us this summer, and she, she did a project all on her own. She called it Project Sara Bay, which means good in Malagash. And she collected, I was telling her about how we taught these kids how to wash their hands, and they had never seen soap before. And so they were like at the watering hole, and their whole arms and faces were like all white because they were so excited about the soap and so she um, went to area businesses and collected um, toothbrushes toothpaste soap and then she wanted it to be really sustainable and she didn't want to put it in a plastic bag so um, she got with some local uh, high school sewing clubs and they sewed these little bags for the kids and we had middle school students like 
take photos of, of them packaging up the bags and then they wrote notes in Malagash on, on the backs like about brushing your teeth and about um, you know health, being healthy. So um, we were able to give those to like 500 kids in Lavavulu. We did puppets with kids. We had to really, I mean, we had to close the doors and like not let any more kids in. <laughs> um, it was really, they're really excited about it. And um, also um, thanks to Blake Park Zoo, um, together with the kids in Itampulu, um, which is where that school is, uh, we were able to paint this, this mural um, that, uh, that actually says like protect um, the biodiversity for our future so um, I think it's a real great story about um, the wonderful things that can happen when when different organizations and, and groups come together to work on a common goal okay here's the school we did it okay so we got there I never built a school let alone build a school in Madagascar so um, we did it. We built the dream school. We, we hired a, a local construction guy. We got all the permits from the school. Um, we had this MOU with the, uh, with the village for, for a long time because um, after three years, they'll take over the, the payments to the teachers. It will be completely s sustainable and belong to them. And I, I put this on here because that's our building permit written on a, a piece of cardboard there tied to a euphorbia tree. And this summer, um, we also had another uh, tortoise festival. Um, we just made the, co the costumes out of like, th those are made out of recycled materials. It's all cardboard. Um, and they had, the kids did a big parade and they made up again, like original songs. Um, so again, I think it's a really um, great program. And I think that, that one thing that's really important about programs in the field um, is that you just have to keep coming back. The first time that I came to uh, Lava Vulu, um, we met with the local teachers and they said like, well we've seen like many people come through here and they, they always ask us what we want and then they make all these promises and then they never come back. And um, I think that happens a lot or, or we think that we know what kind of things would be a great fix for these communities but in fact a lot of times, I don't. I don't think they need to be fixed at all. I think we have to spend a lot of time, like, listening to what their 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 wants and needs really are. I spent a lot of time talking to the people in Lavavu on this last trip to ask them, like, why really did they want to build the school? Like, what was the real importance of them to have their children? Um, educated because as I was talking to another girl who's working in the area researching tortoises she said all the communities always say they, they, they want a school but then she said like the kids don't really attend the school but the kids all show up in the mornings for the government lunch program food program and then all the parents are like waiting around back so like maybe the answer really is like they don't want a school but they they need like a sustainable food program so I think that that's one thing that's really important is just listening um, and this is actually I, I wanted to, to show this picture of the the kids with the blank park city sign um, because a lot of this happened these things happened because of the support that we got from blank park Sioux. And um, it's really um, kind of a neat thing. This is at the watering hole. Um, this, this local lady is washing her clothes and this radiated tortoise is like getting a drink from the water. So I think it's a great um, photo to show that there can be a coexistence between the people um, and the wildlife. And um, when, when we can educate people about the importance and the benefits of conservation, um, I think it's really a win-win situation. So. I think I'll end there. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I, I'd be happy to take any questions if anybody has any, if I haven't already talked over the, my limit. <laughs>that uh, it's very different at all the different sites. For example, like in the south, in Lava Vulu, um, they build these giant tombs. So I used to think that it was one of the poorest areas because it's definitely like the people are the most kind of uh, malnutritioned. They're, it's really hot and dry there, so there's not a lot of food. They eat a lot of like potatoes. They, don't, they, they really don't eat rice except for when we come because we bring rice with us. Um, so. As I was talking to them, I, I, I see that they live in these really small houses. And, but they, they ha all of the local people have huge giant herds of zebu, right, which are the, the livestock. And they have goats and they have, 
turkeys and they have chickens, which most people in Madagascar don't have. So in all honesty, like they're all very rich if they sold their livestock or if they ate them, but they don't. Because it, it's like against, uh, it's a fadi or a taboo to ever eat the livestock. However, it's a real symbol of status. So they all have the livestock, and when someone important dies, they kill the entire herd of zebu. And they, they use the horns to build these like, so their house is maybe like, like this, like their little house that they live in, and it's made out of like small little pieces of wood, and it's really small. And their tombs are like this, and they're built out of concrete, and they're elaborate, and they're painted, because they believe that this house is just like an interim and that they are forever in the afterlife in their tomb, right? So it's something important to like think about as we're thinking about like how, what kind of message are we, are we gonna give to them? So at, when I was talking to the people in Mababulu, they actually said like they really love their, their very small community. Almost everyone's like all kind of related. They're, they're really close-knit. They have a real reverence for the, for the forest. The radiated tortoises just go around like they're everywhere, like around our, our camp, and they protect them. However, the nearby Itampulu, which is where the mural was painted, is kind of a bigger city, and they really want to be developed. They're right on the coast, and they're, they're mainly fishermen right but they really want to be developed they want to bring in like refrigeration and and um, sell the fish and they want to become more developed but they are also the ones that are um, cutting down the forest and so the people in Lava Vulu there's there's like a lot of, of fights between them because the people of Lava Vulu are really about protecting it and the people of Itampulu are, are using the resources from the forest. So I think those are all like really important components about you know, how we're gonna move forward. So um, you know, we, we just are embarking on a new project. We're gonna try to do aquaponics in, in Lava Vulu, which is like where you can use fish and the, the fish poop actually fertilizes the plants. You don't need like great soil for it to grow in, you just kind of filter it and you can grow vegetables and stuff because I think one of the things that they 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 really are kind of like starving in Lava Vulu, so they need food. Oops, this was in case I had enough time I was gonna talk about this. Afterwards, if you wanna know about another project, I can tell you. Um, so yeah, I think that that's the case like in Lava Vulu. In, in Kinjabatu, everyone's behind what we're doing. Um, the, the lemur populations are exploding there. Uh, the local people are are starting like organizations selling the crops. Like they're really behind it. They get really upset if there's ever any evidence of a lemur trap or something like that. So, um, but they're also a little bit more like sophisticated in like metro there. So I think each each place is really a lot different. Uh, I I didn't get a chance to talk about it, but that that side of the northern sport of lemurs at the tip top of the island, and that village is completely run by the women. It's a fantastic project. Um, they've really taken over the, the rocket stove and made it into a business. These ladies are like crazy entrepreneurs. Like they, they, they make baskets, um, they run everything there. So I mean, um, all the different, I, I think sites have a little bit of a different kind of niche. So I think that's always really important to kind of learn about that and, and I think a lot of the parents are behind us. Like in Lava Vulu, you know, they really want their kids to be educated, but they, they can't even really tell you what they think that's, that's going to do because many of the grown-ups have never been outside their village, and it's so remote. Remember I talked about it? It's like three days to get there. And um, so it'll be really interesting to see, you know, what happens or... It'd be, it'd be a really, it's a really great place for, for tourism though. I mean, with the tortoises, those, those really amazing caves um, with the lemurs and um, it's, it's really beautiful there. The, the spiny forest is amazing. So, and it's, it is right near a, a really beautiful beach too. So it's a great place to go. Any other questions? I usually go twice a year, so I usually spend the summers there, and then um, 
it kind of depends uh, if, if we get funding. So I usually, I've gone every year in November, December, that's when we do our big education program in Kinjavatu, and then I usually try to pop to one of the other sites. Um, so, um, and then last year I, I went again, we got another grant, so I was able to go again in, in March, April, but, but usually two times a year. I have, um, I, my son still is in high school, so I, I try not to go too much. Um, but in the summers, I, I take him with me. Um, so, but when you go, you know, you want to stay a good month because it takes a couple of days to get there and then a couple couple days to get where you need to go. So, um, yeah, I usually go a couple times a year. And we do have a, um, a staff. And I, when people always ask me, like, how will you know um, conservation fusion is a success? And I, 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 I firmly believe that... Um, will be successful when it's all being run by local people. So we're really about training like local teachers to take things over. Um, we have a staff and a lot of times when I'm not there, they run everything. So um, we really work hard on empowering local people so that they can really take it over for themselves. That's the ultimate goal. I'll just go back as a tourist. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you so much.